Hello, you're watching uh, Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Paul Septel. Um, we're in Paul Septel's studio and we're talking about art. So, again, uh, we're both very, again, talking about the, the conversations that we want to be involved in when we have the art conversation. And, as, mm -hmm. and it, the art conversation is, is a many, many, many pronged thing from the guy who sells in the gallery to the picture, you know, the person who's the portraitist to the landscaper to the, you know, it's such a, a very, very um, wide variety of thing. Art is seemingly a catch-all for, it's, it's a for catch -all anything phrase. which isn't really a, you know, it's a business that you make up as you go yeah, along. It's, 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 it's not an exact thing. <laughs> right. So, you know, you can have five people. It can be a reaction. It can be a creation. It can be yeah, a production. It can it be it, so yeah. many mm -hmm. different variety of things. So, again, it's kind of an, that language is inadequate. Mm. Uh, and, and looking for the adequate language mm. is, is, is why we're here trying to articulate it. Right. Uh, just, just finding it... Uh, you know, we wouldn't be here if there wasn't really, if we both found a need to articulate it uh, for, right. for self clarity and for um, so that we can have take this conversation to a wider circle to to have input and, and well, just to think about what is to, art because I, I, yeah. I think and somebody said to me, the teacher said to me very recently, you know, of course, philosophy of art is important. You know, without philosophy in art, you know, you just have a bunch of colours and you a bunch of notes. It's, it's not the notes that make it music, right? The music is beyond it being notes. The art is beyond it being colour, right? Yeah. Or form. There's something else that makes it art. And even just considering that or thinking about what is art is actually a very important beginning. Like if if your audience hasn't thought about what is art, it's just considering the end result, yeah, the pretty picture, then, you know, what makes it art if it's been done, something that's been done so many times over so many centuries, is it, is it really art because it's just a recognizable form? L let, me, let me step back just a little bit. I, I'm sure. Gonna, I'm gonna step back to uh, The Price of Everything, um, a recent documentary about the art world, which, uh, is an interesting piece on many levels, and I don't want to mm. get into all of that here. But uh, it was very interesting talking, uh, listening to Larry Poons, mm. and and talking about how Larry Poons had done a certain thing. You know, he'd done those kind of little right. circles, and when he stopped doing those things, he was out. <laughs> right. It was yeah. It was like almost like a a, a, a modernist computer language from in the. 70s, right, or yeah. the 60s. So, so he had, he had a shtick, yeah. and they collected him for his shtick. Right. And as long as he did this thing, he was golden. And as soon as he didn't, he was out. Right. So, so as soon as he questioned his own formula, yeah, they didn't really, they weren't interested anymore. Right. It's just because it was a commodification. Yeah. Right. And in every, it seems to me that in every level of this story of art, whether you're dealing with the um, you know most expensive artists on the planet who are being touted by you know huge so-called blue chip galleries, or you're dealing with artists who are in a tent. Yeah, everybody's looking to make a product, which is to me the paintings as a an object, as a material form, are, are the byproduct of a metaphysical state of thinking. Yes. I know that sounds almost pretentious, but, but there's... I, I, I under, but yeah. I understand. And then there is that the other reality. And it, it all has to be it all has to be dealt with. You can't not turn your back. But you said right. it's something interesting. You said there's a difference between uh, your audience and your collector. And let, let, let's expand. Let's go in that direction a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I make art for everyone, for that experience, for the power of art, for to be confronted by a sense of feeling and me a metaphysical state that's, that's made concrete. Um, and that, having grown up going to museums, you know, this public forum of art 
and the critique and understanding of what is art in this public forum was essential because it educated my thinking. It didn't mean I had to possess these forms because it takes just a rare, unique individual who's going to have the capacity to become the guardian somewhat of a metaphysical state made concrete, right? You know, that takes a place to store the works, an appreciation, uh, a deep pocket, yeah? And above all, Archives. an incredible love. Yeah. Because to put your money where your mouth is when it comes to art, to come from your own heart and to see something and say, I need to have that, I need to take care of that, you know? And one day I'll donate that to a museum. And this piece is important rather than, and I, I can't say that one is better than another, but I know that that is my thinking about that. Then this goes with the sofa or this will look good over mantle or over my bed. I certainly am not opposed to creating something at the end of the day is beautiful and that people can look into over a lifetime. That is really what I want, is you know, for every square inch to be somehow of wonder over a long period of time. And because the pieces are irrepeatable, it means that there is only one person there and, and the piece is as rare as the individual who is gonna buy it. Um, and if it's too inexpensive, you know, and it's too available, then are you going to be sure that it's going to find its way in time and be looked after? Or is it going to be just given away with a sofa when, at this point in time, people will buy a home furnished and they want decorature, I call it, all right? It's interesting, but are they really going to prize those works? They've got a one-off, so... And, and, and that, in the, that in the movie was the justification for the... For the uh for the pricing of the art, is that it will be, it will be taken care of. Right. And, and right on. Right, exactly, yeah. because yeah. you have to understand the value, you know, that is being put into something. If, if these pieces are unrepeatable and they take me three months, if you want to even just get down to brass tacks, even if they take me six months, and that six months is over 10 years, you want to pay me enough so that I can just pay my rent for one month? Or should I, you know, cover my overheads for a little longer? If you have something permanent that is gonna bring, bring constant, like, uh, joy and experience and, and value into your life, how does the artist need to be remunerated? What is the value of art at that point, right? I mean, if it's a pretty picture and it's being made as a product on a production line, is it, is it art and art? Are these two pictures of the same value? What, what do we know about that? What is the value? So it's a very spurious question. It almost behooves one to cultivate their collectors. It, 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 right, it, 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 it's a, a relationship too, it, isn't it? It's a relationship so they're, they're knowing what goes in mm. so that they have a sense. You know, again, because you live it, mm. because it's always there because you have mm. a, Again, we, we've, we've discussed this, that there's an audience in our heads mm. that knows if the thing is right, if it's wrong, if, if it's redundant. If, right. If there's, you know, that it, this would be almost invisible to anybody else. Right. But we know, and that's a very discerning audience. Right. And, 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 and to reproduce that outside of, with, you know, a, a, a real audience and collector base, to yeah. have them like the audience in your head, boy, what a wonderful world that would be. Right. You know, I'm really fortunate in that those who have collected my work, you know, actually step forward and, and being able to purchase a piece and take care of it and have it forever are generally all the very top of their field. And they're like from every field, from, um, you know, virtuoso violinists, to, you know, the most vi famous violinists on the planet, to um, you know, people who deal with epide epidemiology and uh, uh, the front lines dealing with Ebola in Africa. Um, people who really actually had to rise up within their field and become the very top. And that takes discernment, you know, whether it's lawyers or those who are dealing with f in finance and real estate, uh, 
you know, on a global level, to really understand something about something unique, you really have to have followed your own path and gone deeply into it. Whereas I think the audience in general, it, it also touches a much wider audience from, yeah. from children to from people of all ages, shapes, sizes, colors. Art does cut through all of that. Um, and I think that gets really exciting, even when I've had groups of people with special needs come in here and explore the pieces. And it's, so it's not about one thing or another. It's not about your station in society. I've exhibited in so many different places and, and sometimes just that salt of the earth kind of worker who comes in and says, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, so right? You're, you're, and it's you're, a lot more you're, honest you're, than... Your work does have um, a, a lot of portals of entry. Hmm. You know, right. You know, you, you have surface, you have below and, the surface. And not and everybody speaks in abstract terms. And so sometimes when people come in and they're confronted with this, their first question might be, well, what's your inspiration? What's it about? And, you know, rather than hearing my gibberish, I yeah. say, well, what does it remind you of? What does it make you feel? And often I hear stories of people traveling and having gone diving or looking at the earth from space, being high up in an airplane. It's always some personal experience or a dream. It's much more interesting for me to see what you feel and see in a piece and what it reminds you of, because that, that's an entry point. There's a point of conversation. Right. Oh yes, this reminds me of going swimming in a, you know, cenote or or diving and the, the the changing hue of blue as we went deeper and deeper and you know that it's because it takes somebody has gone inward into memory and is is feeling that past moment. It's like you know when I t talk about reading Proust, you know what what, what what reading Proust does because it's a uh, a journey into involuntary memory. As, as, you, as you read another text, because the way this text is constructed, it takes you through your own text. Hmm. Uh, so you, right. you, you, relive exactly. your, you relive your own experience in a very heightened state because the artist was able to show you his state in a, in a very heightened uh, right. way. And that's what and that's a very are, are, magical, that's, very magical very thing magical. for a creator to be able to take their audience to, into the book of self. So, so I don't know if we've used the word sorcery and alchemy here, but I mean, right? But it is in that you're, realm. You're, you're, I mean, you're closer to alchemical than anybody that I would know because of the original trying to turn these, you know, of, of the of the of the of the materials you're using. Well, to me, you know, alchemy. What I all I know about it, not really being a chemist is the, uh, the spiritual and esoteric uh, notions and, and things I've discovered through reading in that way. And to me, turning base metals into gold is also like the story of the spectrum. And the spectrum is the story of the spine. And the spine holds all of the colors of the rainbow. And the ancient cultures of the world even talked about, you know, the rainbow and the serpent. All right, and so that is a story of Kundalini, of the serpent that lies dormant at the base of the spine and rises up through all of the colors and the energy places to from the base to the crown, from red to gold, okay? So f to transform base emotions and experience into higher wisdom that's the premise of alchemy to me. That's all I know about alchemy. People do confuse my playing in the dirt with actual chemistry and, and alchemy. Well, when let's, it's, let, we'll we, talk about, we're talking about something else. We'll talk about that. metaphorical yeah. alchemy. This is Mark Baer, <laughs> I'm with Paul Sattel. We're, uh, this is Conversations and Collaborations, and we'll be right back.